Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's discussion on the challenges of implementing biodiversity offsets in development. My name is Imrana Jalal, and I am the chair of the World Bank Inspection Panel, and I have the pleasure of moderating today. As you know, this biodiversity offset advisory is the fifth report published by the inspection panel in its emerging lesson series. This one on the topic of biodiversity offsets. Specifically, the report provides insights from the three inspection panel investigations dating back to 2002 into the Kalagala biodiversity offset associated with the Bujigali power project in Uganda. This report and all the other emerging lessons report can be found on the inspection panels publication panels website. The report is intended for those with an interest in development projects and biodiversity conservation, including the staff and consultants of the World Bank and other multilateral development banks, development organizations, government agencies, conservation NGOs and CSOs, and other development agencies more broadly. We hope that the observations and insights presented in the advisory report can serve as a learning opportunity for future development projects and their offsets. The purpose of this session and the observations and insights presented in the report is not to rehash all the issues around the Kalagala offset area, but rather to look at what we can learn and how to take these lessons forward. I really look forward to discussing these topics with our panelists and to hearing their responses to your questions. Biodiversity offsets are certainly an important and timely topic. Increasingly, governments and the private sector are turning to offsets as a way to compensate for the residual and unavoidable impact on biodiversity caused by development and commercial projects. These offsets are implemented as a last resort form of mitigation to balance the project's biodiversity losses with new and lasting biodiversity gains. So the aim of an offset is to ensure at least a no, not, a no net loss and preferably a net gain of biodiversity. According to recent research, nearly 13,000 biodiversity offset projects in 37 countries have been completed or in the process of being completed and implemented. And the adoption of the no net loss principle is estimated to be part of public policy in and depending on the sources between 69 to 108 countries. So biodiversity offset can be an important mechanism to achieve biodiversity conservation. But as the panel noted in its most recent investigation of the Kalagala offset, they need to be well designed, well managed and adequately funded to achieve their objectives over the long term. The panel also found that offsetting an offset runs the risk of undermining the fundamental principle of offsetting. This session will discuss the appropriate use of biodiversity offsets, the challenges in creating and managing them, and ways to overcome these challenges to sustain a successful offset. Joining us today in this panel are four members. Uh, let me first introduce Ms. Anne Kabagambe. Anne joined the World Bank in 2016 and is currently the Executive Director of the World Bank Board. She represents 22 countries, including Uganda. Before joining the World Bank, Anne worked at the African Development Bank for 27 years and is therefore a seasoned development practitioner. Our second speaker is Josh Clem. Josh is the Policy Director for International Rivers. He joined International Rivers in 2014, where he focuses on the growing role of international financial institutions, such as the World Bank, looking at particular in the water and energy sectors. Prior to joining International Rivers, Josh worked at the CSO, the Bank Information Center, for over eight years as, Af as the Africa Program Manager. Our third panelist is George Ledeck. George only very recently retired from the World Bank. George helped prepare the bank's new Biodiversity Conservation Standard, ESS6, along with the natural habitats and wildland policies that preceded it. 
He has published books and technical papers on a wide range of subjects, including biodiversity offsets, hydroelectric and other dams, and the environmental management of wind power. Our fourth panelist is Susan Brownlee. Susie is a registered natural scientist in the field of environmental sciences. She also has published a number of papers in peer reviewed journals on a wide range of topics, including biodiversity offsets, and has contributed to the writing of both national and, and international guidelines on impact assessment review, biodiversity inclusive assessment, and of course, biodiversity offsets. Susie worked as an expert, expert consultant for the panel in its most recent Color Gala investigation. Thanks to all of you who are watching on, on YouTube and participating. So here's our game, game plan for today. In just a minute, I'll ask our panelists to make opening remarks lasting between five and seven minutes on today's topic before I turn to your questions. Thank you so much to those of you who sent your question at questions in advance and we received a large number of them. We were still receiving questions late last night as well as early this morning. For the sake of efficiency, we've condensed some of them and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, uh, and hopefully we can finish them all uh, before we ask the panelists to make their closing remarks. Which brings me to inviting Anne Kabagambe who will speak first. Anne, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you very much and uh, greetings to the audience, Madam Moderator and colleagues on the panel. Let me begin by acknowledging how far we have come. Less than a generation ago, it was hearsay to speak about the need to balance the environment with development. We had not heard or even thought through such terms as environmental and social safeguards. But today, I can state that each and every country that I represent at the World Bank Group considers development and the need to preserve the natural environment as both critical and both important. At times, it may seem like an impossible task to pursue our development goals as well as protect our environment as envisaged. And these are economic, social, political challenges. But I would submit that this delicate balancing act that requires balancing the needs and considerations of our national agendas and cultivating deep partnership engagements with stakeholders is possible. The test, of course, that we face is in which strategies will meet these two objectives and make them compatible. How do you marry the demands of a population that needs and is asking for electricity for their hospitals and their schools during such cases like the pandemic that is going on now while addressing our environmental concerns. Of course, we must not lose sight of the fact that these countries are striving towards one thing, to end poverty, towards building a future that would be worthwhile for coming generations. So for African countries and those I represent, the approach comes from the perspective of the need for transformation, the need for countries to transform their economies and their societies. The good news is that it is no longer either develop your economy or take care of your environment. We can do both. But I want to point out one big drawback that I need to highlight 
uh, for purposes of this conversation, and that is capacity, especially capacity to maintain biodiversity offsets. This requires in-country technical know-how and very deep financial pockets. As you in the audience know, offsets are highly sophisticated and complex environmental instruments. When at their best and when they are well planned, they will require major resources to implement them. And as the moderator earlier said, and I would like to repeat the statement that biodiversity offsets must be well designed, well managed, and adequately funded to achieve their objectives in the long term. And I'd like to emphasize for my final comment this long term aspect. The fact is that where there's an obligation for countries to preserve offsets in perpetuity, the nation should be afforded resources to make this happen. And in my opinion, in certain cases, they are, after all, areas of public common good as we would consider the River Nile. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Anne. That was Anne Kabagambe, Executive Director and Member of the Board from Uganda at the World Bank, representing 22 African countries. Uh, I would now like to turn to Josh. Josh, um, over to you. Thanks. Hi. Um, I guess I would like to maybe preface my remarks from the uh, from the outset that you know I'm by no means a an expert on on biodiversity offsets, you know. But we at International Rivers uh, have come across them uh, pretty often, actually, in the course of our work uh, defending rivers and uh, the rights of communities who depend on them. You now, offsets are particularly right in the, in the dam sector uh, because dams you know, tend to be built uh, in remote areas that have high concentrations of biodiversity. Um, you know, I'm frankly not convinced uh, that the World Bank uh, should be in the business of creating offsets. Now, this is a sentiment I think that is Pretty widely shared in our community, uh, and it's not a particularly radical stance either. Now, the U.S. government, for example, uh, opposed the inclusion of biodiversity offsets in the most recent uh, World Bank Safeguard Review. Uh, but in any case, you know, I think this is at least a, a timely discussion. Um, you know, as the the World Bank Safeguard revisions have uh, effectively opened the door to. Uh, broader use of offsets. Uh, so I think um, you know the Kaligala case in Uganda, in some ways, serves as a cautionary tale. You now that I think demonstrates what we believe are some of the, uh, I guess, inherent flaws of offsets, notably around enforcement and and permanence. So we and our Ugandan counterparts in the early 2000s uh, questioned uh, publicly whether the Kaligala offset would be protected. And, you know, I guess just as background, you know, it's important to say that uh, the Kaligala offset was created to protect a, a similar area downstream uh, to the area that would be lost uh, to the World Bank Finance Bujigali Dam. Uh, Bujigali was completed in 2012. Uh, in 2015, uh, the government of Uganda announced its plans to build the Asimba Dam uh, downstream of Bujigali on the Nile. And we again raised with the World Bank uh, when it became clear that the Asimba Dam uh, would be having impacts on, on the Kaligala offset. The World Bank's uh, response effectively was to commission a study uh, to identify the precise areas where uh, the Asimba Dam would impact Kaligala um, 
but the dam was nearly finished by the time that study was finally completed about two and a half years later. Uh, you know, we've been told, um, you know, informally that the World Bank uh, at one point considered insisting uh, that Isimba not be built to its full height. And this would have had the effect of uh, protecting the Kalagala offset in full from, from the impacts. Uh, but the bank in decided instead uh, to create a new offset uh, to compensate for the impacts on Kalagala. So, in effect, they created an offset for, of an offset. And I guess for, for us, you know, the lesson is that, you know, in the end, an offset, an offset is basically just an agreement on paper unless you're willing to ensure that it's respected. And, you know, I, I think it's important not to lose sight of the uh, impacts of the World Bank abandoning uh, the Kalagala offset. You know, I know it's not uh, Imrana's desire that we rehash the past here, uh, but you know the communities that we supported in this case, I think, are keen to make sure that their their story is shared. Um, you know, the World Bank greenlighting the Asimba Dam has led to material and ongoing impacts uh, on the the local communities. So, for example, malaria rates have doubled since the Asimba Reservoir was completed, and those rates are just as high today. Um, many of those who are displaced by Asimba's reservoir have not been compensated. Uh, fish stocks in, in the Nile uh, in this area have, have plummeted, um, and unemployment has surged uh, as the biggest employer in the district, uh, whitewater tourism, uh, has declined by 35%. So now turning to the question of, of kind of permanence of offsets, I think, you know, one of the drawbacks of offsets is that they rarely offer permanent protection. You know, I think good practice requires that permanent biodiversity losses be compensated in perpetuity uh, and with a sustained funding stream. So in Uganda, the Bujigali Dam might be around, it might last for maybe 100 years. But the offset agreement would expire effectively when the World Bank's involvement ends, so after maybe 15 or 20 years. Um, you know, I guess I would be prepared to, to cut the bank some slack on this because, you know, Kalagala was among the first World Bank offsets. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is an issue that, that troubles World Bank projects today. Um, you know, these same issues are playing out right now. Uh, in Guinea in West Africa, where uh, the IFC created a national park uh, uh, as an offset to, to compensate for the loss of uh, chimpanzees, or sorry, the, the deaths effectively of chimpanzees uh, because bauxite mines uh, would destroy their habitats. So this national park you know, would protect effectively the, the last stronghold of the critically endangered uh, Western chimpanzee uh, that's found only in West Africa and which has seen a 95% decline in the last 20 or 90% decline in the last 25 years. You know, echoing Kaladala effectively, you know, the company is only committed to fund the park for the next 15 years. After that, all bets are off. And even worse, the, the government uh, of, of Guinea now plans to build the Kukutamba Dam right in the middle of the national park. Uh, and at least 1,500 chimpanzees are likely to die as a result. So the question is, you know, what is IFC willing to do about it? So I think these kind of questions over uh, enforcement, uh, you know, effectively dog these projects even even today. Um, you know, it's worth mentioning, I think, that the Kukutamba Dam in, in Guinea was heavily promoted by the World Bank uh, in the first place, financing all the studies uh, et cetera, for, for years until they realized uh, that the dam would impact the IFC offset and, and then pulled out. So I think that's probably uh, my time up. Uh, I'm sorry I can't offer maybe a more upbeat take uh, on Kaligala <laughs> and, and its lessons for offsets, but you know, hopefully this serves as a bit of a, a reality check uh, of some of the, the pitfalls uh, that biodiversity offsets can pose. Uh, as we discuss ways forward. Thanks.
Thank you, Josh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Josh Clem from International Rivers. I'd now like to, uh, to invite George Ledeck to um, address us. George. Thank you, Imrana, and I'd like to thank the inspection panel for sponsoring this event and for inviting me to participate. I retired as uh, uh, the World Bank's lead ecologist after more than 30 years of service to the World Bank um, uh, this past February. Uh, I worked a lot on conserving biodiversity in World Bank supported projects, including but certainly not limited to the use of biodiversity offsets. And I want to stress that um, the views I express here are my own and I'm not speaking on behalf of World Bank management. Uh, I, I wanted to start with a brief mention of the Kalagala offset for the Bujigali hydropower project in Uganda. The session is worded with a question, offsetting an offset. My answer to that question would be no. Uh, it, the offset was not offset. It was a boundary adjustment of the conservation area uh, created with the offset. Um, this adjustment was done because of the Asimba project, which was not taken into account uh, when the uh, Kalagala offset was being planned for Bujigali. Um, the original offset was never abandoned. Um, uh, about half of it was flooded, but um, the other half remains of the original area remains intact, including the core area of Kalagala Falls. Um, the legal agreement uh, between the World Bank and the government of Uganda remains. Um, and so it was a boundary adjustment that led to a net gain in terms of with the extended uh, offset area, the length of river uh, encompassed, the number of fish species, including fish species of conservation concern is greater. And the area has also been legally strengthened under Uganda law. Now it's a special conservation area. So it's not just dependent on the indemnity agreement, which will eventually ex expire. So um, I wanna talk mostly about biodiversity offsets more broadly. Um, I wanna say first that biodiversity offsets are conservation projects. Um, the typical definitions of biodiversity offsets uh, mentioned that they're measurable conservation outcomes designed to compensate for residual adverse biodiversity impacts. So uh, their conservation actions, the offsets are conservation actions, usually involving protected areas. Um, and what makes offsets different from most other kinds of conservation projects is they are specifically linked projects that damage biodiversity, that inevitably damage biodiversity by what they're doing, whether it's building a dam or some other kind of infrastructure uh, or other development project. And therefore the challenges of designing and implementing offsets are indeed the challenges of conservation areas uh, and having effective and sustainable protected areas and other conservation actions. Challenges of offsets are the challenges of conservation. The conservation is very much needed today, uh, uh, in particular because the world faces a biodiversity conservation crisis. Another uh, point I want to emphasize is that um, uh, I consider biodiversity offsets to be an important environmental management tool and one that is still underutilized. So uh, perhaps differing from Josh, my view is not that there are too, too many biodiversity offsets, but that there are too few of them, uh, particularly too few good ones. Um, and um, uh, the, what makes offsets an important tool is one, they improve environmental outcomes on the ground. The, the outcomes on the ground will be better with an offset than without it. Um, uh, and secondly, um, Offsets provide much needed funding for conservation. Um, uh, conservation, biodiversity conservation desperately needs more funding and not just in developing countries. And most projects that could have uh, and arguably should have offsets still do not have them. They leave uh, 
environment, they leave damage to biodiversity on the ground without any upside. And so there is, I think, a strong case to be made that more biodiversity offsets are needed, although they, they certainly need to be done well. Um, one other key point I want to make is that offsets are not always the right tool. Um, they need to be used in the right circumstances. They should not be used to facilitate habitat loss that otherwise would not happen. On the other hand, they should accompany projects that would still happen, but where the outcomes can be improved by having an offset. Um, and offsets should not be done where they're not feasible. In many cases, the biodiversity damage just cannot be feasibly offset. And in those cases, it's important to redesign the project or shelve it if the biodiversity uh, damage would be too great and irreversible. Offsets are not usually easy to do when they're done well. They require scientific studies, stakeholder engagement, a lot of upfront and recurring costs. It's uh, preparing an offset is like preparing a second project. It adds a lot to the transaction costs and to the hassle factor from the standpoint of the project sponsors. And uh, so appropriately project uh, offsets are the last part of the mitigation hierarchy uh, that, uh, uh, that says that first, first you try to avoid the biodiversity damage through project design and location, then you try to minimize it, then you try to restore uh, damage during construction, and then as a last resort, you do compensation, including offsets. Um, but where it makes sense, uh, offsets can and should be facilitated, I think more so than is the case through a lot of country and uh, legal and regulatory frameworks. And finally, I'd just like to mention that there's a recent World Bank Group publication, the Biodiversity Offsets User Guide, which provides a a lot of uh, user-friendly information on how to do offsets step-by-step, step, when to do them, when not to do them, how to make them more financially sustainable with project case study, study examples. If you'd like a copy, if you Google Biodiversity Offsets User Guide, you should be able to get an electronic copy that way. If you need a hard copy, you can contact me. Thank you. Thank you, George, and thank you for pointing out to our audience who are watching on YouTube that very important publication. I'd now like to ask uh, Susie Brownlee to take the floor. Susie, over to you. Thank you, Imrana, and many thanks for inviting me to be part of this very interesting discussion. Clearly, there are quite a range of different views about offsets and uh, I'm sure they will all come out. I'd like to start by saying that there's a perception that with a biodiversity offset, you can develop anything anywhere. And that is a perception that is quite widespread. Um, offsets, importantly, have impacts that affect not only biodiversity, but also the people who depend on that biodiversity for lives and livelihoods and well-being. And the key thing about offsets is that they rely on no net loss or net gain. In other words, with each offset, we are allowing certain loss and placing our faith in very uncertain gains. And Josh has mentioned the issue of longevity of offsets, and there are many other issues. So even with a very perfect offset, the extent of our natural systems is shrinking. It's being reduced with every offset because we have to rely on protecting what's there largely or restoring what is degraded. So what has been found uh, over various studies is that even the best offsets make only a small contribution to slowing down regional biodiversity loss. And that is really important. I think as well, we talked about with a perfect offset, most offsets are not perfect. Imrana mentioned the 13,000, I think, cases of offsets. Obviously, there's not papers on all of those. But from the papers that are peer reviewed that we read, there are about two thirds of offsets that fail in implementation. And between a third and a half of restoration offsets don't work or do work, sorry. Avoided loss offsets have similar problems. They can be manipulated. They, they also 
fail. There are problems with offset design in terms of coping, coping with time lags, poor data, poor impact offset exchange in biodiversity and ecosystem services, poor stakeholder engagement, failures in management, failures to provide sufficient capacity, and also in funding constraints. So again, recent studies have shown that biodiversity losses almost always exceed biodiversity gains through compensation or offsets, which means that the trajectories of biodiversity loss and ecosystem services deterioration are actually continuing. And I think as, as one of the speakers has already noted, we are facing two compounding global crises and forget about the pandemic at the moment. But these two both have potentially incredibly severe consequences for people, namely climate change and that of biodiversity loss. We've already impacted about three quarters of our land surface of the planet. About a million species are facing extinction. We won't meet sustainability goals. We certainly won't or are unlikely to meet our uh, CBD goal of Vision 2050 with these current trends. And people depend on, as Anne mentioned, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, which support their lives, their health, livelihoods. So with ongoing loss of biodiversity, we are also having ongoing loss of resilience, both of our ecosystems and of ourselves and our ability to survive and flourish. Offsets are, as George mentioned, a last resort form of mitigation. But they, and, and very usefully, they do give effect to what we call the polluter pays principle, trying to internalize the costs on the environment. But often they are almost a first option for developers, a go-to. So given the plight of nature with these complications of climate change, we should be doing absolutely all we can to avoid significant negative impacts and the use of offsets in the first place. So instead of aiming for no net loss or net gain, we should rather be focused on no more loss of significant biodiversity and simultaneously emphasizing the need to restore ecosystems. Offsets should thus be used with the utmost caution given their track record and they shouldn't be, try, shouldn't be relied on to make unacceptable projects seem acceptable. Now, many of these challenges have come to light through the Kalagala Offset Project, and I'm sure we will touch on them a lot more during the rest of this panel discussion. Thanks, Simana. Thank you, Susie. We've had lots of really interesting and wide ranging perspectives. So let's turn to our questions now. So I'm sorry, Susie, um, you're on first. Um, let's start with a general question. There is a section in the panel's advisory report titled, when should offsets be used? And you know, you've sort of already answered that, but if you wanted to make any um, key uh, points, um, now's the time to answer that question. So. What is the answer to that question in your view, Susie? Right. Well, biodiversity offset should only be used where it can be demonstrated that there are no alternatives to achieving the same outcome of the desired project and that every effort to avoid or prevent harm has been exhausted. And that may mean not just looking at alternatives at project level, but moving up to strategic planning level or sector level to see if there are not better ways of meeting objectives with lower biodiversity and ecosystem services impacts. They should be used when there are residual negative impacts which are considered to be significant. And commonly they are used in natural habitat in, where there are projects in natural habitat which are affected and perhaps controversially they can also be used where critical habitat is affected and i'll get back to that point later 
they are best used, as I said, within the context of a wider strategic framework. So in terms of, for example, spatial land use or biodiversity plans, which are prioritized different areas for development and where limits of acceptable change to biodiversity and natural systems have already been set. They should preferably then only be used in relatively low risk situations. So for example, where there are reliable data on biodiversity, when the affected biodiversity doesn't constitute critical habitat, so in other words, it's highly, um, not highly threatened or unique areas, ecosystems or species, where an ecosystem is fairly widespread and there are lots of options in the landscape for conservation, where there are clear opportunities to add value and where there's evidence that it is feasible to restore degraded areas, in other words, to build up these biodiversity gains that are needed in a relatively short time frame. And I think that's also important. You can't say we'll do something, but it will take 100 years to achieve it because then the uncertainty level becomes unacceptable. Where there's relatively low dependence, thinking now on people's dependence on ecosystem services, offsets are best where there is a low dependence on ecosystem services and affected ecosystems, and where those ecosystem services can be readily and easily substituted. Where there are readily available offset sites and no land tenure issues or complications, and where you know there's stakeholder support for an offset, that would be a suitable situation. And as I think um, George mentioned, where there are legal mechanisms available to support offsets and give them some kind of long-term guarantee that they'll survive. Where there's strong and transparent governance, which is committed formally to conservation and offsets. And crucially, where there is capacity and where there are resources to implement an offset and that can be assured. So there are mechanisms, mechanisms in place for oversight and checks. I think it is important to note, and it has already been noted, that the Kaligala offset predated guidance on biodiversity offsets or good guidance. And a lot of that has come subsequently. And that at the time, bank policy called for an ecologically equivalent protective area to be established and maintained. And I think that is, that is the key here, and maintained in mitigation. So a lot of the no net loss and uh, biodiversity currency and accounting, that wasn't active at the time. But having said that, current good practice guidance was in place when we considered or when the Asimba pose a threat of flooding the Kaligala offset. And that requires assessment of risks and threats to biodiversity and ecosystem services, rigorous application of the mitigation hierarchy before using offsets as a last resort to achieve no net loss or net gain, use of a precautionary approach, and for offsets to deliver long-term outcomes. I think there is, it's fair to say that there is a presumption in good practice guidance against offsetting an offset, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Susie. Um, could I ask you all to please limit your answers to under three minutes? Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Susie. Georgia, there's a question um, from, uh, uh, from, the, from the audience for you. Um, the panel advisory reports six insights into the use of offsets and development. So how can the World Bank, given what's happened, ensure that the many insights and lessons that have come out of the Kala Gala case will, it, will improve its approach and practice in the future? Um, yes, I, um, uh, I happen to agree with all six of the insights as they're stated in, in the report. So I would encourage people to read them. I won't repeat them here in order to stick to my time limit. I would say the best way to, to achieve that uh, from as far as the World Bank goes, would be to diligently apply the ESS-6, Environmental and Social Standard 6, which is part of the World Bank's new Environmental and Social Framework. Uh, this standard ESS-6 is on biodiversity conservation and sustainable management of living natural resources. I think its provisions and requirements are well aligned with the, the insights mentioned by the panel. 
I think um, it's a, it would be important for World Bank management to ensure that there are enough staff uh, available, qualified staff, and enough ex uh, attention paid to um, biodiversity as projects are, are designed and considered for funding. Um, the environmental and social framework covers a great many issues from child labor to gender-based violence to a lot, of, a lot of important things, including biodiversity. So it's important for biodiversity not to get overlooked when, when a project can have many complex impacts. If I could just briefly touch on a point that Susie made, she lists very good criteria that should be part of biodiversity offsets, but I think it's also important not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. No offset is perfect, just as no protected area is perfect. There's an internationally used uh, protected area uh, uh, tracking score, the management effectiveness tracking tool that goes from zero to 100 and no protected area gets 100 in any country, essentially. So uh, there's always room for improvement, but at the same time, we need protected areas, we need conservation, and the, the alternative to having a project that damages biodiversity with an offset is usually having a project that damages biodiversity without an offset. The, the alternative usually is not having the project. That's been the case in my experience. So, so we need to let offsets uh, work as uh, beneficial additions to conservation where possible. Thank you. Thank you, George. And this question's for you. The panels in KOA investigation highlighted the importance of absolutely needing to have proper legal frameworks to govern the offsets. In many countries where the World Bank operates, national laws don't actually provide for offsets as described in the mitigation hierarchy, but still the bank policies require them. What is Uganda's response to this or what was Uganda's response? Mm. Thank you. Um, I'll start by saying that the primary goal of the bank's policies is to set uh, sustainable standards for countries, which, which I think is the right approach. But hopefully, these are designed on the basis of very sound international practice. So point number one. However, on the original offset that was designed in Uganda and the first indemnity agreement that was signed for those familiar with the case, uh, the protection of the Karagara offset was not included. We have moved beyond that and our experience has been that of course if you have inadequate legal and regulatory framework, this will affect how to preserve the long-term offset um, area. So I am happy to announce that Uganda has since updated its legal frameworks in several ways. And I'll touch on it like three with a short time given. One, uh, we have now a National Environmental Management Act that is extremely innovative in several ways that reflects international best practice. And for the first time, we have a legal framework for the use of biodiversity offsets to mitigate impacts on important habitats in the area. Two, to address the long-term protection of the offset area, the government proposed and adopted a national environmental act that uh, led to the declaration of this special area uh, for protecting the legal free flow of the river and the adjacent parcels of boundaries. The third one uh, that I would like to address is the fact that uh, Uganda declared a special conservation area 
for the protection of the Karagara Special Conservation. And this National Environmental Act was gazetted uh, last year in December. So for us, we have learned from this experience that it is better to come upfront with these legal and regulatory frameworks instead of playing the catch up game. But uh, I am very comfortable and happy to say that we are now there. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, and congratulations to the government of Uganda on passing this very important legislation. Um, I think that um, this is a major milestone and that other governments um, who are looking at offsets, are hopefully they will take their cue from Uganda's example in this most recent case. Uh, Josh, the next question is for you. Um, the panel investigation highlighted the impact of those living in the surrounding areas of the offset, those who depend on the river and its surroundings for their livelihoods, uh, etc. The creation or the, the creation or increased management of protected areas for the purposes of biodiversity offsets can have an adverse social impact and as well as an economic impact, including economic and physical displacement. What lessons can we learn from this, Josh? Uh, thanks, Imrana. Um, you know, I, I think when uh, the boundaries of the offset were redrawn, um, you know, it was a big shock for, for everyone. Um, you know, so instead of protecting uh, Kalagala, uh, the offset was essentially moved upstream uh, to an area that nobody particularly asked for. Um, you know, and this had the unfortunate uh, kind of result that authorities uh, showed up driving stakes into the ground you know, telling people uh, that they would have to leave uh, and, and restricting access to the river. Um, you know, I think we and, and others sounded the alarm over this, and I guess we understand that now there's a, kind of a, a process in place to uh, develop livelihood uh, restoration plans for those uh, who are impacted by the redrawn boundaries of the offset. And, you know, I guess this is probably the, the least bad option. Um, but it's really essential, I guess, that, uh, you know, communities are fully embedded in that process. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, whether it's for um, the Kalagala offset, for offsets in general, or, you know, conservation areas the world over, you know, they won't work for biodiversity protections uh, or communities without, you know, having communities really be uh, brought into the process from the very beginning and you know their input sought and you know their ideas about how to actually implement it uh, that that can lead to to those um, you know positive outcomes um, you know essentially fortress conservation doesn't work um, you know it's hard to do it right um, and it, it really does take time uh, to to get it right um, but, you know, essentially you have to get communities on board from the beginning, uh, invested and in, in benefiting also uh, if, you, if you want to lead to positive outcomes. Thank you, Josh. Um, uh, Susie, this question is for you. Related to what we heard from Josh regarding livelihoods, how can the social and economic impact be assessed in a timely enough manner to actually influence biodiversity offset selection and design. Right, Imrana. Um, I think it's really important that biodiversity offsets are addressed as an integral part during of the e environmental and social impact assessment process. And it's important to do that so that the findings can inform decision making and also can influence resource capacity building and financing implications as part of a project budget. So it's not an add on unexpected shock afterwards. Josh has mentioned stakeholder engagement, involvement of local affected communities, and this has got to happen both at project level 
at the project site and in the area of influence and also in and around the offset site. Those people have to get on board. There's got to be collaboration between different specialists within the environmental and social impact assessment process to look at integration and synergy between impacts and possible mitigation, including offsets. And I think, again, the, the identification of risks and consideration of alternatives has to be done at the very, very earliest possible stage of the environmental impact assessment process, process to try and avoid significant negative impacts on both biodiversity and on ecosystem services. And then a biodiversity report should be pulled together with all of the findings, and that should influence both the project proponent and the decision maker in formulating a decision and setting decisions around that or conditions of that decision. Okay. Thank you, Susie. <clears throat> So this question is for George, and it's a bit of a mouthful, George, so um, please bear with me. Um, as you all know, the bank's newish environmental and social framework, the ESF, covers all projects approved from October 2018 onwards. From the World Bank's perspective of the World Bank's use of offsets, what is the significance of the move from the bank's policy on natural habitats to the new ESS-6 on biodiversity conservation, sustainable management of living natural resources, etc. Can you also please explain when in the project cycle an assessment of potential social and economic impact of biodiversity offsets should be conducted? And if and when should ESS-5, which is on land acquisition, uh, et cetera, and involuntary resettlement, as well as ESS-7 on Indigenous peoples and traditional local communities be applied. And I apologise for shortening the names of the long policies, but um, in the interest of time, I've done that. So I wonder if you could have a go at that, George. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Imrana. Um, yeah, I, uh, with respect, I guess, to the first part of that question, uh, the um, the the new environmental and social framework the new ess6 on biodiversity conservation and sustainable management of living natural resources is in substance very similar to the previous world bank policy on natural habitats um, it's more precise which i think makes it clearer and easier to use uh, it's like a if you think of an update it's like a 3.0 version of the natural habitats policy was really the 2.0 and something before then that the World Bank had called the wildlands policy was the 1.0. So, so it's a, it's a more advanced version that, uh, that takes into account lessons that have been learned over the years. Uh, but, uh, but it's not that different in its thrust, but I think it will be easier to use because it's more precise. Um, as far as when in the uh, project cycle, to look at the impacts of offsets. Um, the offset should be thought of as part of the project as soon as it becomes apparent that it's needed because there are residual adverse environmental impacts that cannot be addressed through project redesign, avoidance, minimization, or, or restoration. So, so, in, uh, so when an offset is needed, it should be considered part of the project, part of the project funding, and whatever um, social impacts it may have or other um, uh, impacts that need to be mitigated, they should be part of the environmental and social impact process, just like any other component of, of the project. And uh, regarding the third part of your question, when to bring in the other World Bank policies, this is just my own opinion, of course, the, the other standards, the one on um, land acquisition and, and re involuntary resettlement and the one on indigenous peoples. I think they need to be brought in in every case where they're relevant. They need to be applied. And when you have situations involving offsets and protected areas, you have to take into account the, the existing land users. And in some cases, what they're doing is very compatible with conservation and it's a matter of collaborating with the local land users and empowering them. 
in other cases, what they're doing is not sustainable, not compatible with conservation, and it's a matter of how the project can assist with a trend, assist them with a transition to more sustainable livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you, George. That was a, a great attempt at answering three complex questions all together and highly appreciated. Um, I'm now turning to Anne. Um, Anne, as, uh, as the executive director representing 22 African countries, what do you think are the implications as outlined by George for a country such as Uganda? Hmm. A very complex question that George was able to able, uh, respond to. But let me first agree on five points that George pointed out earlier. One, that by, by uh, diversity offsets can be an important mechanism to achieve conservation. And I think that's a, 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 an important point to emphasize. But he also said that they are not always the right tools. Three, they must be able to be designed early when the project is being uh, prepared. Four, that preparing offsets can, in most times, be like preparing a new project. And that has been our experience in Uganda. And I must say that the costs were exorbitant. So having agreed with George on, uh, on, on what he's uh, pointed out at the beginning, I also believe that the bank's goal should be to work really closely with the countries at the beginning to ensure that the overall net benefit for the people and for the environment is upfront and not to wait until the project is fully developed uh, and the need to engage uh, and support the countries and the communities should be right at the initial phase so that all issues are covered. In certain cases, uh, the bank, I must say, will have to consider a need to move with certain policies, but they must be able to engage with the client countries in a holistic manner and be able to recognize that the best designs in projects sometimes have negative impact. This is part of the development process. So engaging in a dialogue right at the beginning and providing the technical support that is necessary is going to be critical. And uh, working with the governments and with the partners would probably address these foreseen problems at the beginning and that is why um, I would do, uh, want to say that some of the uh, problems we are, we are looking at is because uh, we did not begin addressing them right at the time that we were developing some of these projects. Uh, having said that, I don't think that it is unusual, however, for the bank, to uh, require certain national laws that do not exist. And in some cases, like in the case of Uganda, the requirements on the bank's uh, resettlement policy uh, did not necessarily meet the national framework uh, uh, of, uh, of the country. But that does not mean that uh, some of these differences cannot be uh, met if there is an uh, active dialogue. I'll stop here. Thank you, Anne. I, I think that's a very valid point you just made, referring to the design and development and implementation of a biodiversity offset as being 
uh, almost a new project. And I mean, that is a ch huge challenge for borrower countries. I like the way you describe that. Um, and resources are obviously needed to make that happen. So I'm now going to turn to Josh of International Rivers. Josh, your organization promotes a world where healthy rivers and the rights of local communities are valued and protected. How do offsets, such as the Kalagala offset area, allow for water and energy needs to be met without degrading nature or increasing poverty? Josh. Thanks. Um, I guess uh, before answering, I'd like to maybe respond to, to another point that uh, Anne just made about, you know, recognizing that people or uh, you know, the environment is often impacted uh, in uh, development projects. And that's you know, unfortunately often part of, of the process. But I guess I would stress uh, in this case, and uh, especially looking at the Asimba Dam, where uh, really there are so many outstanding issues where people continue to be impacted. Um, so as much as I recognize that you know, development's a, a, a messy business and you know, people often, uh, you know, are effectively impacted. I do think that it's never too late to to go back and redress those issues. So, um, you know, I know that you and as the uh, representative of uh, the government of Uganda and and others, uh, you know, certainly have some some influence back home. So I would maybe uh, see that that you raise some of the issues that I'm talking about here. Uh, as relate to to the Asimba Dam impacts, and to respond to to you, Imrana, um, you know, I, I guess I, I struggle with this this question a bit. Um, you know, I guess it it um, you know, evokes to me maybe this uh, idea that that we've talked about, you know, needing to to find this balance, or that you know, there's somehow um, you know an either or proposition when you talk about meeting needs uh, and then protecting communities and the environment. Um, now, I, I do think it's it's important that we, um, you know, I, I guess my sense is that, you know, the, the threshold, you know, for impacting sensitive areas uh, is unnecessarily low uh, in many parts of the world. I think Susie mentioned this before, you know, essentially certain projects you know, are so, uh, you know, will have such sensitive impacts that they probably shouldn't be built. Um, you know, and I think it's important to also interrogate, you know, what the what those development needs are and the best ways to to address them. I think Uganda is a case in point where, you know, Buchigali's power went unused for years because the price was too high for consumers. Now with uh, Isimba online, you know, have an energy oversupply uh, plus other dams coming online uh, on the Nile uh, that are uh, you know, soon to be uh, completed. So you're going to end up with, uh, you know, oversupply, you know, way beyond the actual energy needs of the country. So, you know, looking at, at Uganda, where the energy challenges are effectively you know, distribution uh, and increasing uh, and, and meeting the access needs of particularly those in, in rural areas who are far from the grid where, you know, essentially household solar is probably uh, the best way to deliver uh, energy access for them. So I, I think it's important that we not get caught up in this kind of uh, dichotomy. Thank you, Josh. Uh, um, uh, very interesting point and well noted. Uh, Susie, this question is for you. To come back to the design of biodiversity offsets, do you think, and, and this is a complicated question, do you think it would be possible and useful to use economic tools to incentivize biodiversity offset outcomes to at least help with the critical initial period of, you know, the first five to seven years of offset design and implementation? Thanks, Imrana. I think it's important to note that different countries have different levels of obligation on or for a developer in terms of the duration of their responsibility and liability for an offset. Some countries I know have at least a minimum of 30 years of obligation. So the five to seven years is just a, a, an initial blip 
But before I before I respond, I'd, I'd also like to just add something, if I may, to what Josh was saying and to what Anne was saying. I think of I think course. what is absolutely critical before a decision and a go ahead is given, it's vital to have pinned down who is what management of an offset is required, who is going to do it, what activities are going to happen. How is it going to be funded? And all of those assurances are crucial as part of a bigger project budget to make sure that they can actually be implemented so that we don't get stuck in a situation where the, the project is, is operative, operating already and we are still scrabbling around trying to work out what studies are necessary to make the project acceptable. And I think in a sense, and maybe that's a little harsh, but that is what, what has happened with the extended Kalagala offset. We are still trying to catch up with the impacts and how to mitigate them. Okay, so to get to your question, biodiversity offsets obviously need to be funded over time and usually it's done by a developer either in a lump sum upfront, which can be a, as an endowment, or they can pay a, or a developer can pay a conservation bank to take over and deliver the offset or one can pay in regular installments. And some kind of guarantees, performance bonds or surety are often required. So if we look at the long-term outlook for an offset, what are the things that could make a difference? Obviously at national level, tax incentives or tax rebates for demonstrated conservation actions and achievements and or ecological restoration could make a difference, but they're likely to take quite a while to to, to to um, establish things like green bonds and financial institutions offering preferential rates for conservation or restoration would be greatly useful. Loans with performance based rewards for good performance in good time. For example, you could have a loan with an interest rate that decreases as measurable targets for the offset are reached. Uh, support for the establishment of biodiversity or conservation banks could benefit developers so that they can provide offsets in advance of impacts, which is always a very strong plus. And then again, resource and land use is compatible with objectives of the offset can be used to generate income in the long term. And I think that's where things like biodiversity stewardships, involvements and buy-in of local communities and other stakeholders conservation NGOs to try and embed a different kind of behavior and support for management for conservation in perpetuity can really be incredibly valuable. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you, Susie. Um, George, uh, I had a question for you, but you, you've already answered it. Um, in your view, you, you have a different take. The panel found that offsetting an offset runs the risk of undermining the fundamental principle of offsetting. And I know that your, your view is that it's an extension of an existing boundary. So I'd, I'd like to come back to Susie and ask Susie, I know you have a different take on this question. Um, would you be able to share, share with us your different view on this, Susie? Yes, with greatest of pleasure. Um, a fundamental principle of offsets is that they should last, as has been said many times already, as least as long as the residual negative impacts and preferably in the long term. And in fact, in the World Bank guide documents, it says in the very long term. So biodiversity gains in offsetting are achieved through protection and or restoration, and they are not instant. To counterbalance losses, often takes an incredibly long period of time to build up those necessary gains. So by offsetting an offset, what you're doing is you're basically winding the clock back, in this case about a decade, and you annul whatever gains through protection and restoration were made. And that's the situation that we have with the Kalagala offset and its extension. And then I think there are other points too. There are cumulative impacts when an offset is lost and another offset is provided, or as George describes it as adjusting the boundaries. Essentially, one is having then to compensate not just for the impacts of the initial development, but also for the impacts of losing the flooded Kalagala offset area. So that again is exacerbating the contraction of natural systems spatially. Then 
I think striving for equivalence, which is a core principle of offset, there must be equivalence in the biodiversity that's impacted and the biodiversity in the offset itself. It's usually a, a, a huge challenge because we have to use proxies for biodiversity that are lost and gained. And when you're offsetting an offset, you're having to try and find equivalents for the first case, which in this case was the ginger reserve and the Bujagali Falls. Now we're trying to have to find an equivalent proxy and, and, and an offset for the loss of the Kalagala offset, part of it, the loss of islands, the loss of free flowing river, changes to migratory fishes, changes to disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's it's a cumulative additive impact that is really not with respect going to be compensated by protecting an additional length of river. Then I think Josh touched on the fact that there's reasonable social expectation when there is an offset of it being maintained in the long term as a core principle. So offsetting the offset has a huge range of livelihood impacts on top of the biodiversity impacts. And that again is both at the original offset site and at the new offset site where there's displacement of activities, maybe loss of access to natural resources, shifting of people away from the offset site, and that in turn will undermine the offset and its value. Thanks, Imrana. Thank you, Anne. George, would you like an opportunity to respond to this or do you feel like you've already made your view clear on this? I'm happy to allow you to make any, any additional sure, comments. Sure. Let me just uh, uh, add briefly, uh, as I said before, I think in this case it was not an offsetting of an offset, but a boundary adjustment and legal strengthening, essentially a correction based on things that were not done initially that in hindsight should have been done initially. So now it's an attempt to, to improve it going forward. Um, I, uh, I very much agree with what Susie said, that, that conservation should be permanent. Um, there's the saying that diamonds are forever, and I think <laughs> conservation should be forever also, both legally, what's on paper and on the ground in terms of uh, protection and management uh, and the resources needed to, to, to sustain that over time. Uh, when a threat materializes to a conservation area, uh, it's important to try to either overcome the threat or if that's not feasible to adapt to it in some way that maximizes the, the, uh, the positive biodiversity outcome. So in the case of Isimba, rightly or wrongly, it was uh, it was not to be for uh, uh, Simba to go away. Simba went forward in the way that it did, and so uh, this is an attempt to, you know, what what happened to Kalagala is is a uh, is a measure to um, uh, to adapt to that situation, uh, and um, uh, which is not ideal, but to adapt to it and uh, uh, get the best possible conservation outcome from it. So ideally, conservation areas would never be threatened from the outside and changes don't have to be made. But when when that happens, uh, it's important to try to make the, the best of it and not to give up on the conservation objectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. And we're now going to move away from whether it was an offset or an offset or was it an extension to a boundary to another issue. And this question is for Anne. And Uganda is endowed with a rich biodiversity which generates revenue through tourism and one of my most enduring memories of being in Uganda on the River Nile was, was, was on a dinghy on the, on the River Nile and looking at the surrounding breathtaking beauty around me. But to turn to the question. So, however, um, it all, Uganda also needs electricity to power the economic development of the country. So, in your opinion, Anne, how does the Kalagala offset area allow the country to balance both sides? Uh, let me start by responding to Josh uh, on the comment he made about some of the work that remains to be done. And uh, to extend an invite to you, Josh, so that we can have a conversation on the comment that you made. I'd be very happy to, to engage. Now, on the question, I'll start with electricity because uh, everybody knows that 
uh, Uganda has a low rate of electricity, uh, actually lower than most East African countries, and, and it has seriously impeded our country's economic development. And like Susie said earlier on, this, I want to remind you that this is climate-friendly hydro power. And so the Jagari Power Project significantly reduced some of these shortages uh, and constituted really an efficient and key component for the country to access uh, electricity. And so for us, that was priority number one. Having said that, I also want to point out something that uh, the Ugandan authorities have often said, that the development choice between tourism and power generation is the country's sovereign choice not the banks, not the partners. What we seek is a dialogue among our partners. So in our view, it is possible for the country to protect its biodiversity, to grow its tourism sector while generating the necessary electricity to power its transformative agenda. Now, with respect to tourism, the government of Uganda has clearly put it as one of the areas that it, uh, it considers to be uh, a major uh, uh, industry and is engaging right now with the stakeholders and has put together a consultation um, process that I would probably want to go through some of the areas that right now we are dealing with because we have uh, a management plan, which of course we are discussing with the bank group. Um, and there are three main areas that, uh, that deal with, um, with the tourism area. The first one is um, we're trying to see how to handle ownership rights for land. The second one, there's an ongoing consultation on how to balance the interests of uh, the tourist operators. The third one is um, this idea of transitional arrangements for the existing activities, which may not necessarily be consistent with the conservation objective. The fourth one is to prepare for the livelihood restoration plan and resettlement uh, of those that need to be moved. And finally, uh, there is um, an evaluation and survey report to see uh, where the compensation, especially for loss of trees, crops, and other income generating activities. So we are we're very much uh, in the process of having a conversation with the stakeholders, the tourism stakeholders. Frankly, at this time, I would like to end by saying that uh, for the last three, no, two and a half months, uh, this industry is at standstill. Uh, so we are pleased that at least we are still able to generate electricity from the hydropower project. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, unfortunately, folks, we haven't even got through half the questions that we received in advance, nor the numerous questions that came through on YouTube. So we only have time for one more question before um, I ask um, uh, the panelists to make their final comments and we, as we head to a close at 11.30. And the final question is for Josh from Ant International Rivers. Josh, from your perspective, what can be done to make future hydroelectric power projects more biodiversity friendly and local livelihood friendly? Are offsets the only alternatives? 
Uh, I'll take the second part of that uh, question first and just say no. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe for, for the first part, um, you know, I think we're, we're really, um, you know, not in the business of making hydropower friendly, um, you know, and I think fundamentally if an offset is the only way you can justify proceeding with a project, I'd suggest that you look maybe more closely uh, at, your, at your options and, and alternatives. Now, there are, of course, ways to uh, reduce the, the negative impacts of, of hydro projects uh, through siting, for example. So choosing sites that uh, may not be the first choice from a power generation perspective, um, but would, have, would entail fewer environmental and, and social impacts. Uh, you know, designing the dam uh, is, is another way. Um, and I, I guess the third I would mention is uh, the need to adopt and most importantly implement uh, operating regimes uh, for a project from the outset um, that are developed in inclusively, you know, with with communities um, and where biodiversity and, and livelihood impacts are given equal weight to, to power generation. Now, this all this all takes time, um, and. You know, making dams less impactful from an environmental and social perspective almost in, inevitably uh, means sacrificing profits or, or power generation. So, you know, this sounds good in principle and there have been many attempts to do this, but, you know, in practice, the, the harsh economic uh, decisions tend to benefit power generation and, you know, the World Bank's uh, dams portfolio is littered with, with projects that uh, haven't panned out quite as as expected. So, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, Josh. Um, well, folks, uh, we're very near the end of our time today, and I'd like to call on our four panelists to make some concluding remarks before we close. So let's start. For, let's start with Susie. Susie, would you like to start? I will oblige. Um, some closing remarks from me. I think first and foremost, biodiversity is held in the public trust for current and future generations. And that is something we, we really can't forget. So offsets should be the exception, not the rule. And the first priority should be to avoid significant negative impacts on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Then I think I'd like to make the point that we need incredibly strong checks and balances when using offsets they often fail in implementation. So there's a need for regular and independent oversight to audit offset performance, to verify the offset, and to ensure that corrective measures are implemented and that there are sanctions in case of failure. Then just lastly, if I look at what the good practice guidance has to say about offsets, really important that, and I think this project has, has, has flagged this issue, offsets have to deal with ecosystem services, not only at the impact site, but critically at the offset site. As we've said during this discussion, it is almost like having a whole separate project. Then the risks of displacing impacts from an offset site to other areas and undermining the expected gains from an offset are really important too. And then very, very lastly, in the concept, I, I want to throw this question out, is the concept of net gain as an offset for critical biodiversity good enough? And I ask that because there's a very small difference between no net loss and net gain. So a plea for greater clarity, definitions and application of a burden of proof for that critical biodiversity impact. Thanks, Imrana. Thank you, Susie. Um, George, um, could I ask you to make any concluding comments and to please everyone to please limit their final comments to two minutes. Thank you. George, over to you. Thank you, Imrana. Um, several panelists have already noted that the world faces a crisis of biodiversity loss. Um, there's also a crisis of climate change. Um, to solve these crises requires a lot of conservation, a lot of conservation of forests and other natural habitats. At the same time, uh, much of the world, particularly developing countries, 
have a huge deficit in terms of their infrastructure, how much infrastructure people and governments want and demand compared to what's available. Um, uh, most African countries have very low rates of electrification still. Um, uh, I agree that hydropower projects have a lot of difficult biodiversity issues often, but all of the means of generating electricity, I would argue, have some environmental impacts that need to be addressed. And there's also the need for water supplies, for food production, for transportation. So there's a huge demand for infrastructure. A lot of development projects will happen, and a lot of those will have adverse biodiversity impacts. I think it's better that they happen with offsets than without. The biodiversity conservation is a huge uphill struggle. A lot has been achieved. A lot more needs to be done. Conservation needs all the help that it can get. Offsets can improve conservation outcomes on the ground. They can provide more funding for conservation, which is starved for funding in the best of times. And now with tourism having temporarily, we hope, collapsed because of the coronavirus, it starved for funds even more because so much of conservation was funded directly or indirectly through tourism. So offsets are an important part of the mix, even if they don't always achieve net gain or no net loss, even if there's a partial net loss, it's still better than having no offset if that's how the outcome turns out. So I would recommend embracing biodiversity offsets as a key tool under specific project conditions. It has to be done in, in the right ways, under the right conditions. Commit to doing offsets well, taking into account the useful insights and recommendations from the panel report and from this discussion. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, George. I'd like now to hand over to Josh Klim from International Rivers. Josh, would you like to make some concluding comments? Uh, sure, thanks. Uh, and I would like to accept uh, Anne's kind offer to uh, have a conversation after the fact about what can be done to redress some of the, the harms from Isimba and, and otherwise. Um, I guess in, in conclusion, you know, I, when, when I look at it, you know, the norm seems to be um, you know, you start with a project uh, that you want to build that Im impacts, you know, X environmental value. You, then you look around for an offset. Um, you propose the offset and then you get on with construction. Um, and to me, I think that's just kind of a, the wrong way about it. You know, you can, I think, avoid the need for an offset in the first place in, in many cases with better planning. Um, you know, I think Susie spoke to this, um, you know, looking at the the sector level to identify, you know, less impactful options and designs and to use available tools uh, to rule out sensitive areas. Um, but this can also save enormous amounts of, of time and money uh, considering those issues up front. Um, you know, as in the, the case of the Kukutamba Dam in, in Guinea where the, the World Bank pulled out uh, after it spent years and, and millions of dollars in making assessments about the project when its high ecological impacts were generally known. Um, so in the end, I think what we need is, is kind of more robust and inclusive uh, planning to identify projects up front uh, that are best placed to, to deliver the, the uh, development outcomes that we're seeking uh, while also avoiding the worst impacts on communities and the environment. Um, maybe just a, a final point that I would maybe point to the work of the uh, Netherlands EIA Commission uh, that in 2016, um, you know, put out, a, I think, a really useful uh, advisory note that discussed uh, how to improve decision making around large dams and to uh, that kind of shows how some of this could be done. So uh, I would point to that as maybe a, a constructive way forward. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Josh. Um, and I'd now like to ask um, Anne Kabagambe of the World Bank Board to make some concluding comments. Anne, over to you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm going to close my remarks by going back to a reference that you, the moderator, made uh, in your opening remarks that there are 1,300 biodiversity offset projects uh, 
in 37 countries. Some have been completed and others are in the process of uh, implementation. And, and I was very encouraged by the fact that some of these countries have adopted a no net loss principle as part of their public policy. So my suggestion uh, to you as experts is that in cases of countries in my constituency that have limited financing and clearly inadequate management of offsets, there could be an option that have been used in other uh, projects that would use that age old and tested concept of partnerships. Now you ask what partnerships, it could be a combination of private sector, corporate entities, NGOs, uh, but to come in and help us to help ourselves. I want to add with this message because without additional support on this very important subject of biodiversity offsets that we have been talking about and without having partnership engagements, the task will remain very uphill one. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, and I'm glad you raised this issue about partnerships to manage biodiversity offsets because it's an important point, isn't it? Because it doesn't mean that our borrower countries have to go it alone. They can enter into partnerships with a variety of organizations. For example, I asked our expert for some examples of these partnerships. And I was told that in Peru, a mining company has worked with local communities, a local NGO and parks authorities to deliver an offset, the Antamina mine in Peru. In Myanmar, although not a strict offset, private companies are reported to work with a range of local stakeholders, governments and local communities in establishing and managing a protected area in a gas pipeline project. In South Africa, a state-owned enterprise works with two NGOs to manage an offset site called the Ingula Pumped Storage Scheme. And a management company has actually been set up with a number of representatives of interested and affected parties and local communities. And there are a number of examples around the world and in, in the United Kingdom and South Africa and elsewhere where conservation NGOs are actually formally and officially appointed to help and implement offsets on behalf of developers um, uh, and, and governments. Um, the key message, I guess, is that without local engagement, support and benefits, many offsets will falter. Well, I think we've come to the end of our seminar today. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be with us today. We really do appreciate it. And, you know, as I looked at the YouTube comments, I realized that we could have gone on longer and there's so many more interesting points and comments and questions. But unfortunately, we do have a time limit. I hope you all found this session useful. Please, everybody listening, stay safe and healthy in these difficult and trying times and have a great rest of your day. Thank you on behalf of the World Bank Inspection Panel. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you.